Welcome. I'm Dr. Liz, an entrepreneur, speaker, podcaster, mom, and wife. This podcast is about hypnosis, but also about all kinds of ways to help you live your fullest life, to heal, transform, to play the long game and go after the joy. You can see more about me at drlizhypnosis.com. Hop over there to get a free hypnosis file to decrease fear and anxiety or one to increase emotional stability. They're there just for you. I hope you enjoy the podcast as much as I do. Peace. Hey everyone, Dr. Liz here. I hope that you are doing well. We're coming up on spring, which means we're also coming up on the rainy season for Florida. So (laughs) you may hear the rain going on in the background of this interview or the ones that I do this summer or the dog making her funny noises when I like scratch her behind the ears. You may hear that too. Today's interview is with Amy Anthony, who was just lovely, I have to say. She is a professional certified aromatherapist and the New York State Representative for the Alliance of International Aromatherapists. She's also a certified aromatic studies method teacher. So she does quite a bit of teaching and education. And you'll see that reflected on her website as well. She has some free courses and some of them are by donation. So she's really passionate about getting some information out there in an affordable way to people about how aromatherapy can help them I found her quite grounded. I don't say that facetiously, (laughs) like someone working with herbs and plants and that type of thing. She really just felt very grounded to me. Our conversation does wander a bit, but we get to how to use some oils to enhance sexual response, how to use them for feeling calmer, more centered, for autism, for ADHD, how, what to use to feel more motivated. And near the end of the interview, we talk about cold infusion. So it's basically putting some plants in some water and letting the water absorb some of the scents and qualities of those plants. And then you can drink that water. So she gives us a recipe near the end of the interview. Now I tried the recipe and I really liked it. I actually liked it far more than herbal teas. <laughs> like I say in the interview, I'm not really a big, huge fan of like the herbal teas, but I really love the cold infusion. So now I feel like I have some more options when people are like, oh, you should drink a uh, raspberry tea for blah, blah, blah. <laughs> now I feel like I have a good option. Like, oh, I can do a cold infusion instead and get the same benefit. So let's jump in to our conversation with Amy Anthony. Hi, Amy. Welcome to the Hypnotize Me podcast. Hello. Thanks for having me as a guest. I'm excited to spend time with you. Yes. I had someone who worked with essential oils on um, a couple of years ago, and I just thought it was such a wonderful topic. And so when you came across my desktop, I was like, yes, yeah, like, absolutely. Let's have her on because it looks like you do essential oil work in all kinds of different areas. Yeah. Yes, but mostly as an educator, because I find as they've grown in popularity, a lot of people have heard of them, but don't know how to work with them. So I find I'm in the educational space. What did you picture when you first started getting interested in that field? Did you not picture it as a lot of education? No, it's a, that's a great question because I come from the corporate America and I you know, had a transition back how many years ago and the essential oils found me and I was just curious and wanted to learn more about what they are, the magic behind them, all that. And I just pursued this obsession not knowing why of just learning and becoming certified. And then once I became certified at the school I learned at, I was asked, asked to become a teacher. So it just kind of the universe to use that language is like knocking on my door and saying yes. And it kind of fell in my lap. Oh, interesting. (laughs) Okay. What was your corporate background? Like what area? Yeah. uh, Market research. So survey design focus groups. I did both qualitative and quantitative. So from thousands of survey responses for like Pfizer yeah. ad recognition to, you know, 
microbial research for hand products. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it, it just ran the gamut. It ran the gamut from product concept testing to stuff like that. Got it. Yeah, it I was fun. To, I, yeah, I used to write reports for that. Like, oh, we're talking <laughs> 20 years ago, really. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm actually familiar with the area. Yeah. And it's funny because sometimes I'll run across something and I'll be like, they obviously did not do any kind of focus groups on this, <laughs> you know, or else they would have obviously found the problems, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. 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 It, and honestly, I, I, this, I think goes into any profession when we can appreciate the qualitative, like the focus groups and the in-depth interviews, and we appreciate the stories mm -hmm. that then you build up to the bigger data sets to get the validation. Yes. Hopefully it's done properly. Like there's value in both. Um, Absolutely. There is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you transitioned out of that into becoming a full-time, um, what do you call yourself? Aromatherapist? Yes, thank you. Yes, an aromatherapist. Okay, yeah. fantastic. And and a teacher, educator. Yes, yeah. I'm a private practitioner, so I do one on one interviews. Um, when I've taught, you mm -hmm. know, I've taught me, uh, several hypnotherapists that wanted to become certified um, in incorporate essential oils into their practice. So, being an aromatherapist, you're always like a it's a modality that could be folded into so many other practices. Agreed. It's often helpful um, to have just all kinds of different tools in, in your toolkit to say if someone mm -hmm. is open to working with essential oils, aromatherapy, whether that really even walking into their own garden or having a plant or a flower around that they could smell that feels calming. It's not even necessarily going out and buying a product, but something yep. that really feels calming, a scent that feels calming, then it's, it's always a good tool for someone to use. Yes. And I'm really happy you said that because part of my, you always grow as a teacher, right? If you're stagnant, you might as well stop. Being an aromatherapist, like you're saying, goes beyond the oil. It's not about buying product. It is about connecting with nature. So sometimes when I've seen a, excuse me, a client privately, you go through a whole intake and sometimes they'll be like, well, are you going outside and walking? Are you getting enough sun? Mm -hmm. I could easily say, just start using lemon essential oil. Da, da, da. It's like, no, let's look at all of you. And are you getting the movement you need? Mm -hmm. I hate the word exercise. Are you getting the <laughs> movement you need? Are you getting sun? You know, and it's, it's a big picture and a, the uh, essential oil is just a part of it. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens when someone is living in like a colder climate where it's dark, like you're up in New York state, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. It, it, it is actually dark. Well, let's say hazy, right? <laughs> like overcast for a couple of months of the year. Um, what happens when someone's in that situation? You could turn to some oils because um, when a, I appreciate my training because it's the quote holistic approach of you always look for the stress response first mm -hmm. uh, as and to support the person in stress responses. I just have to say this. We can't use diagnostic language. We don't treat. We don't cure. We can't use that language. Um, and we're not trained medical professionals. But um, I would say and I have asked like, well, what about getting a like light therapy? Mm -hmm. You know, so maybe it is saying, hey, um, I'm a bit grumpy, I'm groggy, maybe we create a blend for the person that they can incorporate into their daily life and try to get them to be outside or get um, like a light box mm -hmm. if that fits into their life, you know? Yes. It's part of the conversation of that holistic approach. I think that word's used, overused now, but it is true. Holism. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because. People who love plants will often have special lighting for them. So they're growing the plants and they know, okay, they need this much light and perhaps they're indoors and they really can't give them the, the outside light that the plant needs. I mean, some plants are, are um, more appropriate for shade or indoors anyway, mm -hmm. but they don't think to do that for themselves. Like you need light as well, right? <laughs> Special yes. light sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And how many times have we seen the research out there that says you need to go outside and get the morning light because that's about your circadian rhythms, right? Absolutely. Uh, to get that 
blue light in the morning, and then you want more of that far red light, lower light in the evening. Um, so that means we should not watch TV or shut our phones off. Yeah. And I am an insomnia specialist. I'm trained in um, trying to behavioral therapy for insomnia as well as hypnosis for insomnia. And that morning light really is important, even if it is hazy or even if we yeah. get it through a window, not necessarily being able to step outside. Sometimes that's not possible in the, in the morning, um, as well as that late afternoon, like three thirty, four o'clock, somewhere around there light as well. It absolutely does help to regulate our circadian rhythm. So how does aromatherapy, how could aromatherapy actually help with that? With sleep or just in general, insomnia? Well, let's say sleep, insomnia. Absolutely. Let's go there. I have a couple, I have actually several questions about how it helps with different um, problems that people are facing. But since we're talking about light and sleep, let's start there. Mm -hmm. How can it help with both of those? The thing I love about aromatherapy, and work, which means working with essential oils uh, to get technical for your wonderful listeners, you really just have to have some consistency. So let's say you work with me and I make you a blend for sleep. And some of the greatest hits, a lot of people know lavender and mm -hmm. Roman chamomile. And if you hate those, we can always find something else. But a really nice thing to do is to create the ritual as you're getting ready for bed. I'm a fan of sleep mist. So you can have a aromatic spritzer that would be, you know, some essential mm -hmm. oils diluted in water, distilled mm -hmm. water. It could be just uh, in hydrosols as well, like rose or uh, chamomile, so many, but you could spray your bedding as you're getting ready for bed, you know, three to five times, like misting your bed and setting the mood, and part of it is um, the routine, mm -hmm. and not over spraying because the essential oils are sneaky. Okay, they're awesome. subtle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're not a drug. They're not going to go in and like stop and block certain receptors in your body. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they they are going to subtly like nudge your body. I love this loose language to where it needs to be. So mm -hmm. maybe you start to feel a bit calmer, but it's not like taking a sleep. Um, I, I'm blanking out on a sleep drug right now. Oh, there's um, so many. We yeah. could just say a sleep medication. Yeah. <laughs> Ambient. Just, it's not, thank you. Um, yeah. Ambient is a common one. So it's not like taking that and suddenly, bam. You're like, I'm going to sleep. Mm -hmm. It's so much more subtle, like, because you're just <sighs> regulating the body. It's like, I love my herbalist teacher, Jim McDonald, when he says the herbs, which includes essential oils, they, they tell the body to do stuff. Mm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. nudge, nudge, do stuff. Okay. So I, I hope, I just said a lot there. I hope it's clear, like, you just have to do a little, like, nightly do a sleep mist or maybe you have a diffuser. Many people have diffusers now. And maybe mm -hmm. you want to diffuse before bed, not during bed, not while you're sleeping, but while you're getting ready for bed, you're brushing your teeth, you have your diffuser on for like 10 minutes. And that mm -hmm. will permeate the air with the molecules. You'll be breathing them in. Mm -hmm. And hopefully you just feel a little bit calmer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that sounds lovely, actually, to work it into your sleep routine. Like, this is how mm -hmm. I get ready for bed. And this is all the things that I do to tell my body, all right, we're 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 getting ready for bed here. It's time to get sleepy. Yeah. Because like I said, I can't stress enough. It's not that inter, like suddenly you're like, oh, I'm sleepy, going to bed. It's just, that's not the way the oils work. And one thing I've learned as a practitioner is to set people's expectations. And I think the term is effective when I say it takes the edge off because we mm -hmm. can work with the oils for pain management, mm -hmm. you know, for sleep enhancement, for memory or for cognition and memory retention and recall. It's, it's a boost, but it's, it's not drastic. Mm -hmm. we'll use that word. Which ones are good for uh, memory retention. I love that. I haven't heard of that before. Yeah. Um, kind of a, a go-to classic is rosemary. And there is research. There's more and more mm. research being done, thankfully, on helping just memory formation and the clarity, mental clarity 
of the mind. I couldn't tell you the chemistry behind it, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and people are still trying to figure that out. But mm -hmm. smelling rosemary, eating the plant, like mm -hmm. cook with it, have the herb with you, rub the leaves if you have it growing in your garden. But having that, people have like diffused it or smelled it while they're studying to mm -hmm. increase I don't like this term memory performance, but <laughs> to, to give that kind of bright uplift um, sensation. And I do want to add something that is really important that aromatherapy, these volatile, highly concentrated oils we're working with, they work on many levels. And one of that is memory uh, formation and recall. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to bring it back to the stress response because when we're stressed, mm -hmm. it, it's proven that your hippocampus shrinks, mm -hmm. you know, the place for memory formation. And when we're stressed, we're not helping ourselves. So when we can bring in that parasympathetic nervous system response to say, hey, it's time to rest and digest, the, you have a better chance of memory formation and retention. Yes. Okay. That makes sense to me. So you're really calming down the system. You're you're helping yeah. activate that the yeah, parasympathetic system with yes. let's say a scent, and then that in turn helps you recall things and and um, move into a state where you can sort of rewrite some of those pathways. Let's say that's very yeah. similar to hypnosis, actually, <laughs> when we're going into more of a a relaxed brainwave state. So we're moving from beta, which is where most of us walk around in during the day down to alpha, which is a more relaxed state, or even theta, which is an even more relaxed state. We know that we can change neural pathways, we can create learning, all kinds of things happen more easily in those states. So it also requires a state of focus. So when you're learning something, so let's say a state of focus, and then that relaxation happens then it yeah. it just helps the system. So that makes total sense to me. Like a wonderful scent can help you feel more calm, more relaxed, slow to the, let's say slow down those brain waves a little bit so that mm -hmm. then you can recall or remember or retain it's something you're trying to to learn or change. Yeah. And you're thanks for sharing that because the word that's coming to my mind is receptivity. And often um the oils can help with that sense of reception because when you can calm your nervous system down, you can be more receptive. So I'm just going to tie mm -hmm. this into my like, exploration of essential oils and sexuality and sensuality. Like when you have things like patchouli and vetiver and jasmine and those quote euphoric mm -hmm. oils, um, when you can have that sense of ease in your body, things open up, right? You yes. can be like, oh, I'm pausing. And I'm in my body. Oh, look around me. This, oh, okay. Yes. I never noticed that crack in the wall before, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, it's interesting to me too, because let's say you have a particular massage oil that you use with your partner mm -hmm. just to do some foreplay or preparation for mm -hmm. um, more intense sexual contact. It, it does get linked to excitement over time. Mm -hmm. So it may not at first when you first start using it, but over time that will link to, oh, you know, my body's going to move into an excited state here. So, so many scents are, are, I think, linked in our mind like that. We yeah, the, the cue. And also there is evidence that the essential oils, because they're so tiny, they're so molecularly tiny mm -hmm. in lipid loving, they can and they potentiate activity with dopamine receptors, with GABA receptors, with serotonin mm -hmm. receptors. So there's, there's scent association that mm -hmm. is incredibly powerful. Yeah. And then there's the, the, like, the tiny stuff going on that when we smell those oils, we are potentiating neurotransmission. Some of these chemical components can dock on receptor sites. Mm -hmm. And also when we're inhaling, because that's what we do, and these are so volatile, they can get into our bloodstream and they travel mm -hmm. around our body. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's a whole cornucopia of stuff that happens. Yeah. <laughs> 
But you start by, like you're saying, it's you start with that, oh, I recognize that, or that's familiar, and that could trigger a response. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, have you ever used them to, let's say, um, or let me say work with someone to actually rewrite a response? Because as I'm saying, like, yes, they get linked with um, really good things in our life, but some calming, relaxing feelings. Sometimes when a trauma happens, it, mm. it could be linked with a smell that someone does not want to be confronted with um, in their environment, like unexpectedly. So have you ever worked with someone to really rewrite those associations? No, I mean, that would be an interesting experience, but I do know, Mm -hmm. uh, I was just attending a a virtual conference two weekends ago with the Alliance of International Aromatherapists, which I am the New York State representative, so I have, Mm -hmm. I'm invested, if you will. (laughs) Um, But there is um, two therapists, two trauma therapists that were presenting that do work with essential oils, and they are bringing up something that we're always taught that if someone is smelling an oil and it triggers a memory, you don't have to go there. This is why it's important for people that hear about oils Mm -hmm. and you hear peppermint is great for headaches, right? Mm -hmm. And what if you had a really bad experience with peppermint? I, as the aromatherapist will not tell you to use that. I'd say, let's find something else. We could definitely find something else to help you. Yeah. But I, so we want to be very careful about uh, uh, aroma triggered memories and mm-hmm. trauma. But you are bringing up something powerful that I do know a, a hypnotherapist here in New Jersey. She works with essential oils to create these anchors mm-hmm. um, to, to always anchor you back to the feeling. So I'm, I'm kind of, oh, I feel like yes. on a tangent, but it's, yeah, yeah. it's really powerful to, Find that if there is an aroma that you want to help someone reintegrate, mm-hmm. you could work with them safely um, mm-hmm. with someone like you who has training. Mm-hmm. But I haven't. I don't have your level of expertise in that. You know. Therapy. Yeah, I think they'd have to be dual trained. Is my guess. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Technically, you could say, all right, is there a scent you want to bring into session that you would like to anchor mm-hmm. to? Maybe perhaps something you love. And be open to that as a as a hypnotherapist, absolutely. But I think ideal if you are rewriting something like that in regards to a trauma, then ideally you would have someone trained in both modalities, hypnotherapy and aromatherapy. That's more complex yeah. work than like bringing your favorite scent. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's so always- I love this. Di- Go ahead. This distinction that's like someone like you, you could work with both myself because I am not trained, a trained therapist um, in that I'm an aromatherapist, but you know what I mean? Um, I would love to help form new memories and associations, but I don't have the training to do what you could do with the oils, you know? Yeah. Um, It's always interesting to me too, when uh, a new client comes into my in-person office and they'll remark on how it smells. It often smells like chocolate in my office. (laughs) Oh, they'll say, oh, it smells like chocolate in here, which I didn't really have an awareness of until um, people started saying that. For me, it cues me into, oh, this is someone who does notice scent. I'm one of those people too. I'm actually extremely sensitive to scents. And so I always notice something like that. Um, People, offices, places that I go, everything um, versus someone who doesn't comment on that. And it's really not as much on their radar. Yeah. I mean, I just have to share something. I think it's hilarious. My spouse, I have him more like notice aromas around us now just through association with me. Cause we'll be out to dinner Mm -hmm. and someone will have a perfume on. And years ago, I just be like, Oh God, this like it's ruining my experience. And he thinks I'm being dramatic. <laughs> but now he'll be like, he'll pick up on someone three tables over and make a face at me. It's like scent travels, right? So it's it's very it public. Uh-huh. It's very public. And uh, all of us should be aware of how powerful it really is. <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> I think some people are more sensitive 
to sense than others. I had a friend years ago that I met through like a transformational workshop we were doing. And we had a discussion about perfume because she always wore perfume. And in her culture, it was actually disrespectful not to wear perfume. Somehow, you know, like your natural body odor was considered ugh, mm-hmm. lucky. So you needed to wear perfume and apply it several times a day. And mm-hmm. we were doing something together. And I had asked, like, do you think you could not wear your perfume? <laughs> She was like, what? (laughs) But it led into this discussion about these cultural differences, as well as like sensitivities like that had never occurred to her that it actually may affect someone else negatively or be offensive to someone else or something like that. And her is quite the opposite. I I love that because it to me, I love that cultural difference. Like, let me just back step here. Like everyone has different receptors. And there's Mm -hmm. lots of science about um, anosmia, especially or like losing the sense of smell or not being able to smell particular chemical components that are in that comprise aromas. And like you could be smelling, um, what's a classic one? It's about pork. I think like someone could have a different receptor and someone smells pork and then the other person smells urine. So we all have different receptors. (laughs) Awful, right? Yes. All right. Uh Or like being able to smell asparagus pee. Yes. Like I can smell that. Some other people can't. So there's a lot of examples of how our receptors are different. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the desensitization we do. Because let's say you and I wore perfume. You get used to your perfume. You get used to your office smelling like chocolate. So you don't notice it anymore. Yes. Mm -hmm. So there's all these differences because this is all chemistry based. This is chemosensory stuff we're talking about that we're all different and it's fascinating. It is. It is. <laughs> yeah. We sense uh, things differently. We're more sensitive, some people than others. We're on a scale mm-hmm. there. Um, absolutely. And we know that, especially through COVID, we know how important that sense of smell is to keeping ourselves alive, right? Like if you, if you can't smell, <laughs> food, you have very little motivation to eat it sometimes. So that became very clear during COVID, like, oh my gosh, eating became a chore for a lot of people who lost that sense of smell. And we know this from, from studies way before COVID, but that it just made it so apparent in, let's say the, the public eye around how important smell is. And it, it helps us even identify whether something's rotten and we shouldn't need it because that would be dangerous for us or whether something's okay. Um, but yeah, it's just so important, I think. You know, uh, I just wrote down the word joy and that's something that aroma is are complex, you know, really volatile, complex components. And they bring joy. Like my job is so cool. Like I was just doing this um, big PR event related thing earlier last week. And I got to interact with one of the first guests and like, I just to present her with some scent strips and say, you were going to build your own blend for you right here. We're going to have fun. And just to see that person's face mm-hmm. light up. Yeah. That, that is therapeutic in and of itself. Like I will be in public and I'll have like a vial with me in my bag. Cause I always do. And I'll be like, smell this. And you'll see like the person's face change mm-hmm. and generally light up. So when we are sparking that joy, not to sound all Marie uh, organization lady, what's her face? Condo, Marie Kondo. Kondo. <laughs> <laughs> but you you know this, right? Like when we can smile, we're changing our chemistry. We're changing our neuro, like the neuro pathways, right? And yes. If I can make someone smile through smelling rose, mm-hmm. I just change that person's day. Like mm-hmm. that's really big and so small at the same time. Yeah. Well, I want to change topics really quickly here to autism and ADHD. We were talking about some sensory stuff before, and I know Mm. sensory is a big component of autism, some sensory sensitivities, let's say. So I know you sometimes talk about how essential oils can help autism in ADHD. Could you give us some information about that? Something I want to stress about essential oils 
is that, I don't think I said this yet, that less is more. And generally, um, yes, you have like a hypersensitized neurology that this mm-hmm. person, I remember I had a, a client whose son was adopted and I won't get into their case because that's not right. But this person was so sensitized, had to wear headphones all the time and you want to bring calming in. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we always have to remember, regardless of the individual, more doesn't mean better with aromatherapy. So many people will often go to some of the greatest hits for calming could be the vetiver. Well, I shouldn't say that. I wanted to hold that one, but vetiver, cedarwood, lavender. I already mentioned chamomile. Mm-hmm. Some of those, if given an excess, can have the opposite effect on somebody. Okay. So if you're working with an individual that's, if I may use the word hypersensitive, uh, you just want to introduce the oils to them Mm -hmm. and let them participate. And generally I'm thinking of children. Of course, this would be adults too, but -hmm. you could have the oils. You could put one drop on a scent strip and you say, hey, what do you think about this? And you just watch them react, ask them to share what they're feeling. And we're just... Essential oils can generally be broken into what I joke are uppers and downers. Like that's mm-hmm. a way to get our head around things, right? We have the rosemaries of the world and the Roman chamomiles, like mm-hmm. polar opposites. So if you want to this person to come to a just kind of calm state, not asleep, right? Just calm. Maybe you do present cedar wood and mm-hmm. it's sm- that people smell it. You're breathing in and like just see what happens. But the takeaway is less is always more. Okay. So uh, start when you have someone that's really, really hypersensitive, uh-huh. start so small. You know, start small. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. No, you said oh, it. Start small. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. And I, uh, the idea, too, of you said it before when we started our conversation go outside. If you are in a, uh, you know, a non stimulating environment, if you can go into a sensory garden and have the individual like rub their hand against a rosemary plant, mm-hmm. or if you're warmer in some place like Florida, maybe you have Elon Elon growing, or you have some eucalyptus down there, you could have the sensorial thing and encourage smelling mm-hmm. and just see what happens. Because I think um, when I've, I don't work with children a lot, but when I have, it's really important to engage and allow them to help choose. That's really important. Yes. I just started doing adult autism evaluations, actually. Mm. And it's such a uh, prominent topic in the adult autistic world of how do you create a safe environment for yourself? Mm. How do you attenuate some of these sensitivities so that you don't get overwhelmed so that you do feel more regulated. And so Mm -hmm. I think it is, I think it's a wonderful way even for adults to start to be able to utilize another tool to help themselves feel calmer and more regulated when that's appropriate for them, let's say. So yeah, stepping outside, if you're in an environment where that feels calming and wonderful and seeing what does help me um, feel better? Is it rosemary? <laughs> is it, what's the other one you, you mentioned? Is it lavender if it's planted in your garden <laughs> you yes. know, or mint? Yeah. Um, yeah. All of them. Yeah. It, I just, like you said, it is important as the space is neutral and calm and not overstimulating, of course, but I think a really effective way is to engage directly with the plant. Mm-hmm. And if that's not possible, it could be inside in a really nice, you know, neutral environment where you have, you could go to your supermarket and buy ginger, mm-hmm. right? And and lemon and rosemary and thyme. And you could get all those from the supermarket and then you could sit there and engage with them. And if something's appealing to that individual and they're like, oh yes, I want to spend time with this. This makes me feel happy and, you know, calm mm-hmm. or whatever the right word is for that person. Then you might present the essential oil and say, hey, let's take one drop of this and put it um, on a cotton pad and you're going to carry that around with you. Or, you know, then you can create the tool for the individual. Yes. But yeah. I love that. Start, okay. Start so small. Start, start small with the natural environment, basically a natural, mm-hmm. uh, the real plant itself, yeah. and then move to the essential oil that matches that. 
Yeah. You know what? I want to share something that's, um, cause this just happened at that event I was mentioning. I had with me Melissa essential oil or lemon balm and mm-hmm. it's has a lot of historical anecdotal evidence and some clinical for working with anxiety, lemon balm tea, you know, mm-hmm. and the essential oil is so darn strong. It could be really off putting for people. Mm. So I actually pre-diluted it in a carrier oil because people were blending, uh, making their own little thing. Mm -hmm. So I was really aware that I know the benefits of this oil, but I can't present it in such, it's 100% strength. It's too much. Yeah. So if you're working with someone or you are someone that is very sensitive, that your nervous system is so sensitive, it behooves you to go small, gentle dilute, you know, mm. and that's the story about essential oils. Please dilute them. They they are 100% <laughs> concentrated yeah. uh, substances that, you know, they're so potent that we must dilute them. Mm-hmm. Got it. Got it. You know, something that's really important to me, I, I already mentioned it, but aromatherapy can connect us with nature. So if you're someone like me that spends most of their time in Manhattan, New York, it could be so over stimulating. Oh yeah. And if you can reach for your roller ball or the bottle to smell, mm-hmm. you know, to get a, yes, you're breathing deeper, you're breathing more slowly because you're thinking about smelling and, but it's a gift we can give ourselves if we find that we are living in a certain situation, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so not everyone has access to nature or a really calming space, but the Engaging with essential oils and plant material can be, it's, it's, it's a thing. It's a start. Yes. Yes. So we have talked about autism. What about ADHD? Is it a similar strategy or is there um, something that you would recommend specifically more for ADHD? So I don't have uh, in a lot of expertise in this, but cause that would be the, it's about focus right? Mm -hmm. For people that want to, on various levels, to bring a sense of focus. But I'd say it's similar because it's connection, Mm -hmm. centering. It might be different essential oils for the individual, Mm -hmm. but it's still scent reception, bringing a sense of centeredness. I'm just thinking, yeah, it's about centeredness, and mm-hmm. being uh, these words that are so in the zeitgeist now, but being centered and calm and grounded mm-hmm. is is really important. So someone that has uh, autism and ADHD, I just wanted to share, like, I would present vetiver to either individual and see what happens. Okay, vetiver. Yeah. And what about for motivation? And that's not just ADHD, but in general, do you find that there are, are scents? Of course, everything is individual, like we've been talking about, yeah. but are there scents that are more um, traditionally that activate people, that help people get a little more uh, motivated to do oh, something? Yeah. And um, by the way, this encompasses everything, but generally speaking, for the gamut of any human being, unless you have a bad association, the citruses are generally very well recepted, excuse me, received by people. So red mandarin, sweet orange, they're kind of these go-to classics that are sunshine in a bottle Mm -hmm. and kid friendly, adult friendly. um, They are always a go-to to to have as, um, as a therapist. Uh, But for motivation, there's, I'm like, heck yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> I want to just swear like, heck yeah. Um, definitely like rosemary is hands down. Lots, a lot of evidence behind that. Peppermint mm-hmm. is like, sh- it's, it's effervescent. It, it really brings a little spark. Mm-hmm. Uh, motivating. I'm like laurel, bay laurel, like the kind we cook with. Yeah. Very motivating. Myrtle. Uh, motivating. Mm-hmm. These are all respiratory health too. Uh-huh. Uh, and essential oils work with, you know, they run the gamut. They're really antimicrobial, generally speaking. They mm-hmm. they do a lot, but um, the ones I just mentioned are great for respiratory health. 
Laurel, Myrtle. You could go to tea tree too, but I just, as a practitioner, don't turn to tea tree. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me see. Tea tree is pretty somebody intense. Else. Like there, it's intense. I think. Yeah. It's, I mean, it has a risk for some real negative effects sometimes. Uh, you know, people I've known that have used tea tree and they're like, I don't know why there's a burn on my hand. And it's like, oh, maybe it's the tea tree oil. You know, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't start what, there unless you're working with a practitioner. Like if someone wants to use tea tree, I actually do recommend that they talk with a professional aromatherapist um, to make sure yeah. it's safe for them and they're using it safely. It is about dilution um, and less is more. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's some, oh, basil. basil. I was just spending more time with basil again to be, it's, it brings this kind of states of like, it's first a little bit like uplifting, then it could be incredibly regulating as time goes by, Mm, you know, within let's say 10 minutes. Yeah. Oh, within like 10 minutes and not like an hour, but like 10 minutes. Yeah. It's like, that's fast to me. Well, I'm, I'm exaggerating. It's like, it's not like it's, you know, five hours. It's like you could bring, have this excitation and then over some time, um, Mm -hmm. a bit of a, just more calm. Mm, love it. I'm pretty sure I have basil in my my yard. It's not technically a garden. <laughs> Back there wow. I have this teeny little yard behind my townhouse. And I'm nice. always trying to plant different things like uh, mint, chocolate mint. I'm pretty sure there's some basil out there. Lemon balm. Ooh. I know. So that when I cut the grass, it smells great. <laughs> Oh, point. But you can also harvest them for tea um, yep. to just smell, like pick the leaf and smell it to, um, so basil, that's wonderful. Oh, yeah. I mean, one thing I was just writing Tulsi, you know, holy basil has a lot of evidence for, let's just use the word anxiety. Oh. But if you could, this is also sweet basil you could work with. And one thing I really enjoy doing when you have the basil, when it's starting to flower or even before, but mature enough, you can start collecting like lemon balm and mm-hmm. basil leaves mm-hmm. and make yourself a cold infusion. Like you Ooh. do a cold brew coffee. Really? And let that sit. Oh, heck yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. I love it in the summer and it's just try it. It's tasty. It's pleasant. So you pick um, a couple of leaves, like a handful, like two or three a handful. So okay. get a yourself handful of leaves, yeah. a both. Yeah. And then a cold infusion. So uh, like eight ounces of water, let's say, or maybe it's 12 ounces. And then. Okay. So uh, you stick it in the water. Yeah. Or maybe rub like, them Like let's a say a mason to, jar, put the lid on. Yes. yes. Let it and steep. put it in the, in the fridge uh, uh-huh. six hours uh-huh. you know, or overnight. And then you could strain and then just drink through the day. Ooh, wonderful. Okay, yeah, I'm going to try that. Please do. And we should stay in touch because like having that to offer, when I see clients, I often have a homemade tea and I'll ask them preferences before, but mm-hmm. um, it's just, you just watch the individual and ask for their feedback. Like it, it's powerful. You don't, again, have to use the oil. So if you mm-hmm. wanted to engage somebody uh, with a tea, it's so much more gentle and subtle. Mm-hmm. Like we're talking, if you're working with folks that um, are diagnosed with ADHD or it's, it's a, it's a nice gift to have that more um, cool, like slower sensorial experience. Like it's mm-hmm. a soft experience. I feel to have a soothing cold infusion of uh, tea. Wonderful. Yeah. I could see that. Is holy basil a different strain of basil? Than the sweet basil. Yeah, yeah. So um, I have to get what? Asimum sanctum. It's, it's, uh, is Tulsi or holy basil. Okay. And Asimum basilicum is, uh, is sweet basil. Okay. I'm just going to go to my, my oils here and make sure I'm telling you the right Latin name. Yeah, Asimum basilicum is uh, the normal garden variety basil. And then Uh Asimum sanctum is your holy basil. Uh, But honestly, like the sweet basil, it's just, I don't know who, unless it's a bad association, you could just rub those leaves and look at someone's face. 
Uh-huh. As they rub the well, leaves. I, I'm them. asking because I, I think I'm definitely more familiar with the sweet basil because of cooking and, and all of that. And it's pretty easy to find um, at my local Home Depot or whatever. I don't think I've ever seen holy basil. I think I would have picked that up. Like, hmm, maybe I can plant some, uh, bring in some spirituality into my backyard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> holy basil. You know, now that we're talking about this, I have a feeling you're going to see it in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yes. That often happens to me. In fact, back to the laundry room story, this really sweet repairman came out and he was so nice. No one I had ever seen before in my life. And he told me what hose to do. The washer basically needed a new hose. Um, mm. I said, okay. So the next day I go to Home Depot to pick up the hose and he's at the Home Depot. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh, did I get the right hose? And he's like, no, actually you need to go get this. I mean, never seen him before in my life, right? But the next day I see him there and he helps me again. Super grateful oh. for him. So yes. so yeah, holy basil is going to be everywhere now. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, I'm going to go look for it at Home Depot and it's going to be sitting right beside the sweet basil. <laughs> I hope yeah. so. Or yeah, someone will give it to you as a gift, I hope. Yes. Um, or, you know, yeah. any other nursery. There's lots and lots of nurseries down here. It doesn't have to be mm-hmm. uh, Home Depot. But um, but yeah, that would be wonderful. If someone gives it to me as a gift as well. Yeah. But I do, I'm excited we had the cold infusion conversation because I've noticed that since I started making cold infusions of chamomile, Mm -hmm. rose, any aromatic that's not hard and woody, like you couldn't, it's hard to do a cold infusion of cinnamon. Um, But to do those leafy things, Mm -hmm. it's just, I just hope everyone tries it. It's, it's poetry. It's just like (laughs) subtle and you're not, you're not destroying the aromatic chemicals you're not burning them off uh-huh. you're not bringing bitter components into your tea uh because oh, heat brings is out that bitter. what happens i was wondering yeah. because it's like i do not like herbal teas actually with the exception of um earl gray english breakfast are obviously herbal mm-hmm. teas <laughs> but but i'm talking like chamomile or yeah. raspberry or something like that they never yeah. taste really good to me and it must be because of that. The heat does the bitter. Yes. So, so if you can simmer, simmer ever so slightly, then shut off heat and move to the side. Uh-huh. But the cold infusion, I encourage you. I hope you try it. And again, yeah. for clients, for people that are interested in essential oils, essential oil bearing plants, um, it's, I think the theme of our conversation today is gentleness. Yes. Um, yes. So. I'd agree. Yeah. The cold infusion sidesteps that completely. The bitterness. So yes. I'm looking forward to to actually trying that. Yeah, please do. Um, so now I'm smelling basil. Uh, but anyway, sorry, I, I sidetracked a, a bit. Wonderful. But. That was that like wonderful sigh that you did. Like, oh, basil, holy basil. Yes, wonderful. Well, we are coming to the end of our conversation here. Can you please mm. tell people how to find you if they like to work with you or they like more information about aromatherapy or essential oils. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to share. So um, I have a website, nycaromatica.com, and I am first and foremost uh, an educator. So I have a free, you know, how to diffuse essential oils class. You just have to sign up for it. How to make herbal infused oils class, Uh, intro to aromatherapy. Like why is it called an essential oil when it's not Mm. essential or oily? (laughs) Um, I have a lot of how-to classes that are pay what you wish. I'm a big uh, believer in community work and trying to make uh, aromatherapy accessible, Mm -hmm. such as like drinking the tea. I just put an article up about basil, by the way, that has some blending ideas. Um, But so my website has lots of free information or hopefully very affordable information. Mm -hmm. And then I have a podcast where it's very aromatherapy focused, um, called Essential Aromatica. Mm -hmm. But I'm really happy to share with the world that I worked on a project for about a year and a half called Luna Aroma. And I'm putting up an episode on every new moon Mm -hmm. about connecting with an essential oil and that time of year. And Mm -hmm. I give a guided meditation and I just, it's a very special uh, project for me. 
Mm-hmm. That, um, I hope to make aromatherapy accessible to people. And <laughs> that's great. I love it. I love it. All right. So lots of good places that they can find you and, and find information about how to help themselves with aromatherapy. Yes. Uh, uh, Liz, this has been a really delightful. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on. truly enjoying today's episode. Remember that you can get free hypnosis downloads over at my website, drlizhypnosis.com, D-R-L-I-Z hypnosis.com. I work all over the world doing hypnosis. So if you're interested in working with me, please schedule a free consultation over at my website and we'll see what your goals are and if I can be of service to you in helping you reach them. Finally, if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the podcast or tell a friend. That way, more and more people learn about the power of hypnosis. All right, everyone. Have a wonderful week. Peace. This podcast is not mental health treatment, nor should it replace mental health treatment. If you need therapy or hypnotherapy, please seek treatment from a trained professional.